And I am delighted to be part of tonight's event. And of course, I wish we could be together in person, but I'm really looking forward to having the graduation in person and being able to salute you all at Scott Stadium. Uh, I want to thank Savannah Williams and Maria Lovano for organizing the Charge to Class and graduation more generally. It has been, I'm sure, for them a bigger lift uh, than they had planned when they signed up for it. Um, and I'm really excited about this lovely alternative to the usual Charge for the Class. I think the charge is one of um, the law school's best traditions. I think it's just a lovely one. It's a time for us, the faculty, to celebrate you, our three L's, and everything that you've accomplished, which is even more than the usual three L's, uh, given the circumstances, um, to mark your transition into the practice of law, to welcome you into the UVA Law alumni community, and to offer some wisdom and advice. Um, and I think it just says a lot about this place and about how students and faculty feel about each other, um, that you all invite a member of the faculty to address you at this moment. And I will tell you that I know that our faculty um, view being invited to give the charge as a real honor. Um, every one of us loves getting to know you here in and out of class during your three years. We share in the joy of your successes. We love watching you grow as students, as people, as lawyers. Um, it's why we do what we do, and it is what sustains everyone who works here. Um, so as we think about your three years here, we are filled with pride for who you are and for everything that you've accomplished. So congratulations. Um, my main goal today is to introduce Professor Rachel Harmon, and it is my privilege and honor to do so. Professor Harmon is the class of 1957 Research Professor of Law and the Director of the Center for Criminal Justice here at UVA Law School. She is a graduate of MIT, the London School of Economics and Yale Law School. She clerked for the Honorable Guido Calabresi on the Second Circuit Court of Appeals and for Supreme Court Justice Stephen Breyer uh, before she joined the Justice Department's Civil Rights Division uh, in the criminal section as a trial attorney. She spent eight years investigating and prosecuting hate crimes and violent crimes by police officers and other government officials nationwide. Uh, she left the Justice Department in 2006 to join the faculty here at UVA, much to our benefit. Uh, she teaches in the areas of criminal law and procedure, policing and civil rights. She has just published a pathbreaking new book, The Law of the Police. It is the very first resource for law students and others who seek to understand how American law governs police interactions with the public. She is literally creating a whole new field and a whole new way to think about policing and especially how we police the police. Uh, over the course of her remarkable career, Professor Harmon has been a student, a practitioner, a teacher, and a scholar of the law. Perhaps most importantly for what you are about to hear, she is one of the wisest people I know when it comes to careers and career advice. I have no doubt that you have chosen for her to give this charge, at least in part because many of you have already benefited tremendously uh, from her wisdom and her mentorship. And for those of you who have not yet you heard the tales of how amazing she is and you wanted to hear it for yourself. Uh, so she is just uh, incredible in guiding students toward their ideal careers and beyond. And you all are in for a real treat. So congratulations. And I turn it over to you, Professor Harmon. Thank you so much, Risa. That was an incredibly generous introduction. And um, thank you to the good people of the class of 2021 who have invited me to give this charge. I wish I could be with you in person, so it felt a little less like a webinar, but you know, needs must. To tell you the truth, I find your choice of me a little bit puzzling. John Harrison is a lot smarter than I am. Caleb Nelson, a lot wiser. Deirdre Enright is a lot funnier. Andrew Hayashi is a lot younger, and Michal Barzeza is a lot better looking. So unless you voted for the shortest law professor, in which case I tie with the dean, or the one who likes to do pull-ups the most, in which case maybe I really do win, I'm not sure how I rate it. More importantly though, I really feel inadequate to the task because during your time at law school, I have droned on endlessly at you about mens rea and Miranda and how meth labs in Mexico affected American drug markets, but you've actually taught me far more in these three years than I have taught you. Here are some of the things I learned from you. You taught me about patience. When a historic pandemic shut down the law school as you knew it, and the professors for whom you paid about a gazillion dollars a year showed you that we couldn't chew gum and Zoom at the same time, you took a deep breath or meditated or zoned out with Grand Theft Auto 5 or whatever to wait us out. You didn't complain, you kept the big picture in mind and you kept faith. 
And when I said the wrong thing again and again, and sometimes condescendingly, not one of you said to me, okay, boomer, or at least not while you were unmuted. You also taught me about lawyering. You guys have interned and externed, argued motions and appealed. You wrote briefs, tried cases, you freed the innocent and convicted the guilty. And I'm sure you made heartless corporations a lot of money. And then you shared those experiences with me and I'm a better lawyer for it. You taught me about community spirit. You've taught each other, trusted each other and touched each other figuratively as well as literally. You gave to those who needed you in shoulders to cry on and thousands of pro bono hours. But my favorite example of what you did, this pandemic posed a lot less of a threat to most of you than it did to the people around you, including older staff and faculty and the Charlottesville community. Still, you wore masks and you socially distanced and you partied only within bounds. You literally saved our lives by keeping transmission numbers down. It couldn't be more proud. You taught me about bridging differences. You are an amazingly diverse class. That means you're divided by race, by religion, by politics, by your experiences and goals, by your beliefs and your identities. And the world around you in these three years has done everything possible to exaggerate those differences. You arrived in a town that was still reeling from the after effects of its summer of hate. You entered law school during the Mueller investigation and then immediately endured Justice Kavanaugh's confirmation hearings and its controversies. And only then did things really start to get hard. You got through the presidential campaign and the election, and you became the first law school class in history to suffer not just one, but two presidential impeachments during your studies. I bet most of you know more about Article 2, Section 4 of the Constitution than you know about the Fourth Amendment. Though that's possible that that's because Sai Prakash is a better teacher than I am. And yet, amidst all that, you have worked to be part of a community worth being proud of. One filled with friendship and loyalty, one that values honesty and dialogue, and one that recognizes and respects difference. You get to take all of that with you and enjoy the relationships you've developed long after you leave here. Finally, you taught me about resilience. You have basically been on a three-year ride on Disney Space Mountain. Not only did you have to learn how to be a lawyer, figure out what you wanted to do and get a job, but you basically had to do all of that in the dark while you suffered isolation and loss, personal grief and national trauma. You had a year of your life shrunk down to a circle of six feet and you had to watch George Floyd die again and again. And yet you learned you worked for justice, you maintained your sense of humor, and you picked yourselves up and got yourselves ready to go out into the world. So really, really, you should be giving a charge to me. But as you will find early in your career, sometimes you do a job not because you're the best one for it, but because you are the one standing there. Apparently right now, I'm what you've got. So here goes. I don't really have a charge for you so much as an anti-charge. In these days of vaccines, I'd like to inoculate you against some of the bad advice you're likely to receive as you march toward graduation. So here are the things I want you not to do. You are going to be told to listen to your heart. Don't, at least not when you're making decisions that affect other people. The world's injustices have almost all been done by people who believed in their hearts that they were good people doing things for good reasons. I don't have to tell you they weren't always right. Consider the many prosecutors who, trusting their God, or cut discovery corners so that they could put away people who they really believed were guilty, though sometimes they weren't. The fact is, listening to our guts or our hearts often steers us astray. We convince ourselves that what's in our best interest is also right, that we're, since we're good people, our actions are good too. But really, like everyone else, we fear what we don't know, we're biased against those who are different, and we mostly listen to what confirms our pre-existing beliefs. Justice Holmes famously said that even a dog knows the difference between being kicked and being stumbled over. Now, you know I hate to criticize a Supreme Court justice, but he couldn't have been more wrong. Dogs might know that, but almost everyone I know thinks that if something hurts them, it must have been on purpose. 
And when someone disagrees with us on something really important, we usually think it's because they're evil. All that's to say, our instincts often fail us, especially when it counts. So instead of listening to your circulatory or digestive systems, I charge you to listen to your fine-tuned brain. We work pretty hard here at the law school to make it stronger, faster, and better. Make decisions on the best available evidence, be generous when you interpret the behavior of others, and be a hell of a lot more critical when you're examining your own. Always check twice, three times, to make sure that you're being fair, especially to those who are most unlike you. Because otherwise, I think your heart is going to make excuses that your head should not abide. Okay, my second piece of advice is this. You're going to be told, follow your passion. Don't do that either. Most of you have no idea what your passion is. And that isn't really something to worry about. Except for occasionally attending my to my children and exercising way too much, I've basically spent the last 20 years thinking about almost nothing but policing. Some of you have, rightfully I admit, called me obsessed. But it didn't start out that way. When I graduated law school, I had no clear idea about what I wanted to do. But I knew I was interested in civil rights and I believe deeply in government service, which I had done some of before. So I applied for almost any plausible job at the Department of Justice. I took a job prosecuting civil rights crimes because it involved hate crimes, which seemed cool, and I had done some stuff related to that, and prison cases, and I had worked on Rikers Island, so that sounded fun, and it was. But I soon realized how much I loved the policing cases that we did, and I was off and running. Now, if that office hadn't taken me, then I probably would have worked doing housing discrimination cases. If that had happened, then I would have spent the last three years teaching you that housing discrimination is what enforces poverty and segregation and undermines the quality and equality of American life. I would have been entranced by the Fair Housing Act and local zoning laws instead of asset forfeiture and state use of force statutes. Though I'm sure I would still have grand theories about how to make things better, maybe I wouldn't have been very good at it, but I would have loved it just the same. That's because most of the happy people I know didn't choose a career they were passionate about. Instead, they started at a totally imperfect but plausibly interesting and meaningful job, and they got to work. They looked for ways to get better, and they stuck with it for a good while. And as the years added up, they built expertise and skills, and for many, passion. So if you make a serious go of your first job and it sucks, switch gears. Don't be miserable. There's just far too much interesting legal work to do for that. But if you don't hate it, work hard at it and give passion a chance to follow you. Third, you may be told to strive for success, to always be, try to be the best at what you do. Don't do that. The thing about success is that it's a product of what other people think and value. And being the best is about how you compare to other people. So I'm a decent amateur triathlete. I make the podium most of the time in my age group, but I can do my personal best and lose, or I can have a lousy day and win. I enjoy winning, but I can't really take it seriously because whether I make the podium or not mostly depends on whether the people out there who are inevitably faster than I am happen to show up. Measuring your life by comparative metrics may help motivate you at least for a while, but it also encourages you to cut corners to get ahead, to step on other people, or to get bitter when someone beats you out. It makes you think you've succeeded when you could have done better, and it makes you think you've failed even when that's not true. So Michael Collins, the Apollo 11 astronaut who died this week, I don't know how many of you knew him or knew about him. Um, he, by the way, did triathlons. He could have thought himself a pretty unlucky guy if he compared himself to Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong, who got to walk on the moon while he stayed behind. After all, he never became as famous as those two, and maybe you didn't know his name before, when he died. But he helped humanity stretch to new limits and expanded our understanding of our place in the universe. And for him, that was enough. Even the smartest, most hardworking, and most ambitious of us won't even usually make the footnotes in history books. And that's okay. Far more important than striving for that recognition is doing what you do well and keep on doing it. Success may come or it may not, or it may come and disappear. And you just need to be okay with those outcomes. 
So when I think about this in terms of my own career, I often think about bed bugs. A few of you might recall that around 2010, after about a half century in which no one paid any attention to them or thought much about them at all, New York City suffered a mass infestation of bed bugs. It left 8 million New Yorkers and 65 million people who visit the city each year itchy, sleep deprived, and pretty well panicked. And newspapers around the country, but especially the New York Times, sought to understand the problem and what to do about it, which meant that all of a sudden, the country's four or five bed bug researchers and like the dozen or so cockroach and flea experts who knew a little bit about bed bugs, they were constantly on talk shows and the front page of the New York Times. And being an entomologist, which hadn't really been a big thing at cocktail parties before that, was suddenly all the rage. It was like being an epidemiologist today. But eventually, the bed bugs died back and the media moved on. So I said earlier, I wasn't obsessed with policing when I went up to the Justice Department. By the time I left the Civil Rights Division to come here in 2006, clearly I was. I wrote my first article about police violence and I traveled the country before I took the job here, giving job talks about it. And I was told, I kid you not, that the law governing the use of force is kind of a minor cul-de-sac in Fourth Amendment law and policing as a focus for a legal scholar was a bit obscure. So obviously that's changed and I've gotten a lot of opportunities as a result, but it's not really because of what I did. Now I did put myself in a good position by working hard on a subject I care a lot about and I encourage you to do that. But policing put itself on the front page. So I expect that like the bed bugs craze, that will ease. Maybe climate change or immigration or God forbid a major terrorist attack will lead people to focus a lot less on policing. Or maybe communities will abolish police departments and no one will care how I think we should govern them. I just can't do anything about that. But I can do continue to do what I do and try to expand what we know and maybe make things better in the meantime. The thing about success is that it isn't fair. It sometimes goes to those who don't deserve it, or at least those who don't deserve it any more than you do. And sometimes you're gonna feel resentful or underappreciated because of that fact. But if you let those thoughts strip you of contentment, you're giving others far too much power because what counts in the end is not whether you're in the spotlight, it's what you think about what you've done. So I charge you, pick your thing, devote yourself to it, and be ready when an infestation or a pandemic or a public crisis happens. But be okay if no one cares as much as you think they should, or if you don't always get the accolades. That way you can live your best life. And long after you're no longer the youngest, smartest guy in the room, and I promise that's gonna happen, you can still take pride in what you've done. And finally, <laughs> sorry about that. My last piece of advice is this, I have pretty stupid dogs. You're going to be told, do the right thing. Don't, well, I guess maybe do, but know how badly that misconceives what life is going to throw at you. Most of life's ethical choices don't come neatly labeled. So if you're expecting the tough moral decisions are gonna be served up to you on a silver platter with hard choice on the left and the wrong choice on the right, and all you have to do is pick the hard one, then you're likely to make a lot of wrong choices before you even realize you've made choices at all. For one thing, wrong decisions aren't always made in leaps and bounds. They're often made one little bit at a time and eventually they add up. You don't admit a mistake because it would make you look bad. Or you describe something you did with a little extra flourish. And then you keep saying it because you said it before. And before you know it, you're Bill Clinton lying about sex, Lance Armstrong lying about drugs, or Brian Williams lying about war. A lot of big mistakes start with little ones. Also, a lot of ethical choices aren't so clear. I'm sure most of your speakers are going to talk to you about the greatest thing they ever did. So I want to admit to you probably the most serious mistake I made as a lawyer. It came in my first month as a prosecutor, and this is before I was at the Civil Rights Division. It didn't intend to shirk, but I relied on something that a law enforcement officer told me about evidence in a case when really I was responsible for looking at it myself. And it turned out that the officer told me that he had checked on something that he hadn't. As a result, I actually brought charges against an innocent man. And I only discovered the mistake 
when that man's defense lawyer did his job and insisted on seeing the evidence himself before he tried to persuade his reluctant client to take a plea. We discovered the mistake, we dropped the charges, and the guy was released, but not before he spent Thanksgiving and Christmas in federal detention away from his young children. Then, to compound my error, I didn't report the agent's lie. I mentioned it to a senior colleague who encouraged me to let the matter drop, and I did. And I only thought later about how that decision could affect other defendants. I wasn't trying to do the wrong thing. I was being careless and trying to get along in a new job. I was self-absorbed and distracted because at the time my father was dying. But what I didn't do was take seriously enough the import of the decisions I was making or the care with which I was obliged to make them. And I did harm as a result. I tell you that because I don't want you to make those kinds of mistakes. And the only way to avoid them is to understand that ethical choices don't always look the way they do in the movies. So in the words of a professor far more adept in the dark arts than I am, you need constant vigilance. Pay attention to your choices. Check whether they're kind, fair, and honest, and think about their impact. Choices, in the end, are really all that it's about. Just as your choices have defined your time here, the choices you make, both at work and at home, are going to define the rest of your days. Life will happen to you, but you will be the sum of the choices you make. So ultimately, my charge to you is this. Make your choices well and then come back and tell me about them. You'll find me in the, my office on the third floor, still obsessing about policing. Good luck and congratulations. We are really gonna miss you.